So we'd like to take you on a journey. We'd like to take you back to the 1880s and the story of a beautiful young girl who traveled to Paris. She traveled to the bright lights and the wonder. And when she arrived in Paris, she met a rich young merchant man. And they had a whirlwind romance and she fell madly in love with him. In no time at all, she discovered that she was pregnant with their child. But sadly then, the rich merchant man declared he had no interest in her anymore. He confessed that he was already married. So in utter desperation, like many poor girls in her situation at the time, she took herself down to the Seine and she threw herself into the waters and she sank to the depths and she drowned. But the story doesn't end there because as she lay in the mortuary, they took a casting of her face as was often done at the time and they made it into what was traditionally called a death mask. And these were sold all over France. And you all know this mask because some 70 years later, Peter Saffer and Asmund Lerdell, the toy maker, turned this mask into the most kissed face in the world. The face that you already know as Risa Siani. And they didn't stop there. This was what we'd probably describe as the world's first human patient simulator. And here is Asmund Lerdell himself doing truly immersive simulation in every sense of the word. But they carried on, and their mannequins developed, and they developed, and they developed. They went on to other sophisticated ones, such as Harvey with his funny squeaky heart sounds and his heart things that I could never hear properly, but they were there if you could listen. And then 17 years ago now, we got Simman. And if you had the money and you had the unit to put it in, you could even go further than that. $100,000, you could get yourself a METI. A METI that these things would talk, they would breathe, we could control every aspect of their physiology. Absolutely amazing. But you know what? It's still a hard lump of plastic. Is it real? Does it interact with us the way we want it to? No, it doesn't. Well, some companies have tried to address that. Some companies have tried to make it feel more real. This is Sindarva, and this is one stripped of its skin to show how anatomically perfect it is. If you're doing surgical training, the muscles are there, the skeletal muscles, the bones, the blood vessels, the internal organs, they're all there. 65,000 pounds for a basic one, and it has to live in a fish tank to maintain its integrity all the time. Not the most practical. Other companies have taken a different angle. They've tried to make these incredibly lifelike mannequins. And if you're dealing with an unconscious or an anesthetized casualty, well, yeah, they're fantastic. But many other people just see them as a rubber dead person. They don't interact the way we want them to interact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark? Sorry? I think we've had an upgrade. This one's not rubber. <laughs> I, I don't think it's dead either. <laughs> I think we've just found our new patient simulator. That definitely gives us an idea. <laughs> Live actor simulation is what we use for almost all our scenarios on attack. What you can see there is a young girl bleeding to death. What you can hear is the young girl screaming about breathing to death. But hopefully you also heard how the learners, the firefighter in this case, and the rest of his team is responding to that level of pressure and tension and stress. There's something that a live actor does that a rubber dead person, not you, Claire, a rubber dead person <laughs> just can't achieve. And that is require the learner or the candidate or whatever you want to call them to acquire an emotional attachment to that casualty and therefore the scenario. If you want to truly stress inoculate, you absolutely have to have someone who lives and breathes. It's within our human nature. But the problem with that is, how do you do a procedure on someone who's not rubber and not dead? And as clinicians, we have to be able to do procedures and to do our actual treatments. Well, we were determined to stick with live actors, so we developed some solutions. On the left, you can see our very first surgical airway um, uh, wearable simulator 
Many, many more have been produced since, and there have been some significant upgrades. And on the right, you can see the skilled hands of Mark Forrest doing our very first uh, simulated thoracostomy on a live actor, with a bit of a release of what must be plural effusion in that case. <laughs> Things have moved on a bit since. Force up in. Open. Yeah. Close. Push. Open. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> Emotional reaction, check. <laughs> but where are you going to do this simulation? Now, we've obviously shown pre-hospital simulation. That's pretty easy. That's in a car park or wherever. But where are you going to do it? Most of us do simulation in an ivory tower. That multi-million dollar euro, it's no more pounds, I think, it's coming back. Um, Ivory Tower sitting in most hospitals just looking pretty and amazing. You might have guessed that we're not fans of sim centers at all. In fact, one of the missing outcome links in simulation-based medicine is cost. Cost is real. We have our own simulation center, yet we don't even get our own staff through it because we simply can't even afford it. We can't afford to even get them off the unit. I want to show you something here. This is, just look at the spot the difference. This is a multi-million dollar sim center in Ottawa. And this is main theatres in Cheshire in 2002. We've been arguing against sim centres for the last 20 years. Call it what you like, call it instant simulation, call it applied simulation. Doing things in your workplace is the only way to address latent safety issues and to actually drill your staff with all your own staff present. Excuse the quality of this film. We, we filmed it 17 years ago. And we were testing one thing. Somebody asked the question, what happens if we've got a fire and we have to evacuate? And you know we're in the middle of a laparotomy. What do we do? After doing this sim, not even a year later, there was a major fire in Warrington Hospital at the time. 23 critical care transfers was affected by this team in three hours. That is unbelievable. In situ simulation, it allows you to do things in your own department in your own time. You have to be a bit coy about it. You have to be a bit clever about when you do it and how you make time for it. But um, we will be talking about that in the future as we go on. So how do we build that simulation? How, how do we go about it? Where do we start? Well, the most important thing of all is having a clear objective. And if we lose that objective, well, then we've lost the whole point of the scenario. This must stay at the forefront of our mind, at the top of your simulation sheet, at the beginning and then when you review at the end. Did we achieve our objectives? Because if you didn't, creating Armageddon and all the trauma and the excitement that we might create is just, is just a bit of excitement and fun, and it's not really achieving educational value. And to do that takes time. You can do a sim just off the cuff if you, there's a little opportunity to maybe grab that opportunity in the team. But ideally, for the big sims, for the, for the multidisciplinary ones, the complex ones that we like to run, where you've got some really, really challenging objectives, it takes time. It can take hours, weeks, and for the sort of sims we do at SMAC, even months to plan and prepare. But where do we start? Well, the first thing that we say, once we've got our objectives, is we say, how are we going to get our candidates to experience the learning? We don't just want them to just go down a checklist and just be educated. We want them to experience the whole thing so it's embedded and implanted in their mind. And we use a process that we've defined called CASPER. So let's take you through CASPER now, starting with C. I've just told you that we use almost universally live actors. So they sound like a real casualty, and they sure as hell feel like a real casualty. But without a bit of CASIM, the C in CASPER, they don't look like a real casualty. So we have to have some really effective CASIM so that this looks like a properly, properly injured person. There is a balance to strike here, though. You can have the most immaculate looking CASIM ever that falls to rack and ruin within 30 seconds of the start of your scenario, and it's no good. So you have to strike a bit of a balance, and we've learned this the hard way over the years, strike a bit of a balance between visual impact and robustness. What do we put the CASIM on? Well, we put them onto our live actors, which is the A in CASPER. We take these live actors from two different backgrounds, actually. About half of them come from a healthcare professional, student healthcare professional background. What they do with the knowledge they have is pretty much autonomously deteriorate or improve their clinical course based on the interventions that they hear or feel our candidates delivering to them. The other 
this young lady included, comes from a professional acting background. What she's doing here, standing on this barren wasteland, she's on the top of a mound overlooking a scene of a major incident in which she's just lost that baby. So these guys create really virtuoso performances that makes the learner buy more and more into the scenario and piles on the pressure if that's what we want to achieve. The S in Casper is scenario. What you can see here is some shock being experienced by a very senior Swedish HEMS consultant. And that's because we've designed the scenario to achieve that. The scenario was intended to achieve shock, and I think you'll agree it worked. <laughs> Here's something a bit different. Here is we've stimulated something else. We didn't want shock. We wanted intellectual discussion, interprofessional conversation, problem solving, and a bit of a head scratch moment of, hang on, Firefighter, Sydney, senior Sydney Hems consultant, how are we going to get this person out? So the scenario is tailored to exactly what we want to achieve. In the scenario, we need some props. Every team gets issued a complete kit bag. We give it to them at the start of the day. They check it. They use it. They recheck it. They clean it. They maintain it. It's all theirs. And they also get their simulated patient monitor, which you'll hear a bit about later. So we have all the props we need to deal with the casualty. The story doesn't end there. Here is our prop warehouse that we take with us to every course. We've overgrown the largest size of van that is possible to hire. So if any of you have got an HGV license, come and find me in coffee break, because we need you back in the UK. This is some of the props that we take to the course. Yet you'll be able to see some medical equipment in there, but what you can also see is all sorts of other things, like emergency services uniform, vehicles, building site stuff, uh, bottles of drink, not for us to simulate in a bar. Um, the level of detail you can take this to is not difficult to achieve. These are all cheap things, and we take them all with us. So E is for environment. An environment is something, I think that this one is simple. It's just a, going to be a garage-based scenario with a car. It's, it's a tactical situation. So someone's been driven into by the car, so there's got to be some frontal damage. We'll put some preliminary blood on there. We've got some bullet holes in the windscreen. And it's fairly simple from there on in. No actors in yet, no CAS sim, no other things in. It's just the basic of the environment. But what if we wanted to go further than that? What if we wanted to create a, a multi-vehicle RTC on, on a level crossing? Let's have an LGV there. Let's have a train there. Let's have fire engines. Maybe let's even have a helicopter there. Let's really turn up, let's turn up the volume a little bit. And we can do that too, even before the actors go in. Welcome to simulation in the textile. And no one's screaming yet. Nobody's bleeding yet. But that's the way. With the time in, you put the planning in. You can go as big as you want to go to. And it's not that difficult. But these situations, as you can see, they're not without risk. And when we get onto the R, risk is for review, record, and risk. Risk management. We must overview all risks and make sure the scenario is completely safe. We never want to endanger people. And we'll talk a little bit about safety later. But risk assessment is fundamentally important. And so, as I say, is how you're actually going to review the situation. We use a rolling assessment. You don't just do a pass-fail at the end. We want people to have ticks in every single box. So you start collecting your ticks when you start your first scenarios on the course. And that rolls through the whole, the whole course. And you can see where your ticks are missing. You can share them with your team. And the whole team gets you through. But everyone gets a tick in every box by the end. And then the other thing that we do is record. Now, how we record, we've changed over the years. We found when we've talked to our candidates, the one thing they don't like is being videoed. And we thought, well, why would you not want to do that? Because you can show them the things that people don't like it. We use it from time to time, and it has definitely got its value for educational purposes. But candidates don't like it. And that's important. They've got to be engaged. But how else can we engage them? Pixie dust. <laughs> it's how we learn as children. It's how we learn when we play. It's all about the little things. There's no point just having blood, all right? If you're going to have blood, it's only one cent. It's sight. What about noise? Now try and think about what you want to say next in your, in your presentation where there's noise and blood. And What about another sense? I promise you, I absolutely guarantee you, you will gag at the smell of that vomit that's on that there. You will. <laughs> guarantee. All right? But what about the risks? There's no good just coming in and going, are we safe yet? Yeah, we're safe. No. Have dynamic risks that you can actually see, like that live wire, at the, and have to manage that risk. 
all very exciting, Jace, but here's the elephant in the room. Up until just now, you've heard us talking about our sims for 10 minutes, but we haven't acknowledged any of this stuff, these fancy sim words from the blogs and the podcasts and even now the educational literature. And we'll be completely honest with you, these weren't the building blocks that we built our simulations with. We didn't start with all of that stuff. So we've retrospectively looked back and had a think and decided, do we hit those things or not? Here is the garage scenario you just saw with the lake of blood and the sick on the vomit and the machinery noise. In that, we are challenging communication. We split the team deliberately. We give them noise that they have to shout over. We may sometimes even give them some communications and sometimes they may not even work. What about stress inoculation? We definitely do that. In fact, there's a guy who looks pretty stressed to me. <laughs> He's dealing, he's dealing with a multiple gunshot wound to the chest who's deteriorating fast into traumatic cardiac arrest. So do we tick those boxes of bandwidth, task saturation, stress inoculation? I think we do through designing our simulations with Casper. What about something brand new that came out in the educational literature this year? It's called situativity theory. And it says that the knowledge, thinking, and learning are situated or located within an experience. So here are some learners having an experience in a train carriage. It just so happens that that train carriage is 45 degrees nose up and 45 degrees left wing low. So they're having all of their senses fully saturated, including their ear gyros. And if we were to put them back into that scenario in the future, situativity theory says that all that learning is located within the experience. You take Casper, you link it with the educational content from the literature, and you get to experience learning. And what does that do by the end of the course? Here's one of our teams, not Cliff, not Cliff, it's, sorry Cliff. Um, we put them all in the same gear. We flatten the hierarchy. No fancy PPE, no rank markings, no nothing. They're a multidisciplinary team. On day one, they haven't met. And as you heard Cliff describe, the intensity and the difficulty of the scenarios increases and increases and increases over the three days to the point where these guys, having never met three days ago, can tackle anything we put at them. Even more testament to how we build the team is the fact that these people, the orange team from three courses ago, are still in touch now. We see them tweeting each other, hashtag Team Orange on Twitter, as the days and the weeks and the months go by after the course. Remember, you can have the bloodiest, smelliest, loudest simulation ever. It can all be very exciting, but it's completely useless if it uses its focus. Thanks very much. Spe special correspondent from the ATAC workshop. Um, I just would like to ask, we're obviously very concerned about um, our students or participants' emotional safety. Um, and not knowing what their past life experiences or professional experiences have been. In such a realistic scenario, how do you keep them safe emotionally? How does it make you feel? How does it make me feel? Yeah. It makes me feel anxious. That's good. That's part of it. Yeah. Learning, feeling that anxiety is an important part, but we must protect people. And I think that's where, as Holden just said, we don't start on day one with Armageddon. We, we start with a simple, simple scenario and we gradually build and we build and we build. And that's all part of the building that coping mechanism and the strategy for that. Thank you. Signing out, back to the studio.